we're going to start things off with a beautiful cane pull. This is something that uh, Jeff has been practicing for a while, these really gorgeous filigrana canes. This beautiful piece will have this rainbow as a stem. So tonight we'll be making a beautiful goblet and we're getting things started. Yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna start gathering. So I'm gonna make the, the first thing I'm gonna do is make the, the stems. Well, I'll pull along uh, filigrana cane or Zinfirico cane and uh, I'm just gonna build up the glass uh, for this. And actually tonight we've got a special guest in the amphitheater, Linnea Seidling. Yep, Linnea Seidling. <laughs> <laughs> Seidling. And uh, I wanted to pronounce that correctly. And she's gonna talk to us a little bit about the In Sparkling Company show and uh, some of this, this glass that I've been inspired by. Yeah, yeah. so my name is Linnea Seidling. I am the curatorial assistant here at the museum. And uh, I assisted our curator putting, to put together uh, In Sparkling Company exhibition that's open right now. Um, so the theme of this hot glass demo is asking one of our amazing gaffers here at the museum to, um, to see the exhibition and find inspiration and uh, create something tonight inspired by the show. So Jeff, tell us what you, you saw the exhibition and tell us about what you selected. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing exhibition, and I definitely encourage everyone to uh, come by and see it. Um, there's a lot of great subject matter there and some beautiful glass. And what I was most inspired by in the show uh, were some of the wine glasses uh, that the English made. Uh, a lot of uh, techniques that I've learned and how I've learned to make glass was inspired by Venetian glass. So I saw these uh, wine glasses with the stems that had the twisted cane, the ribbons inside of them. Mm -hmm. So that's a, those, those are just some prominent features of some of the English stemware of the time. And um, that was what I wanted to do. I thought that would be a kind of a fun thing to make, to try and replicate some of the patterning in the, the glass, but then just bring it into a contemporary mode. So I'm gonna put a rainbow in there, oh, fun. Uh, you know, for Pride Month. Yeah. And there's also a twist of filigrana that goes around that too. So using the same techniques, maybe not exactly how it was made, but it's how I, I think of it and how I would see it made, yeah. Great, yeah. so is this, um, so it sounds like you have quite a lot of experience with this technique, can you tell us about that? Uh, a little bit, you know, I've, I've never really, uh, I made a couple pieces just to practice, you see them here in the shop, and I've not really used this type of cane in this way, and the way I learned it was, it's called Sinfirico, and it's a Venetian technique for twisting the canes and making uh, a filigrana pattern or, you know, crisscrossing canes. Uh, and you do that by laying out some linear elements and then twisting them as you pull it out and stretch it. And it makes a beautiful sort of gauze-like pattern. And the Venetians would often um, use this to, uh, to decorate pieces or actually build pieces out of the cane. And you'll see how that would work after I pull the cane here. Mm -hmm. uh, you just break it up and fuse them together and then you can form a bubble out of it. But the English kind of used this technique a little bit differently um, back in the 17th century and they would just make a stem out of it. So it's very elegant and simple, but the focus was on that little uh, color in the stem. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So um, you've learned more of a Venetian technique and it, it is sort of a, a Venetian technique. The, um, so color twist stems originated in ancient Rome, actually. But uh, like many technologies from the ancient world, it was lost for quite a long time, but then it was rediscovered by the Venetians in the 1600s. Yeah. And uh, so that's where you learned it from. And so after the 1600s, the technique sort of spilled through the, the European continent for about 100 years, and then ultimately it made it to England in the, in the 1700s, so in the 18th century. And uh, it became a really popular decorative technique for stemware, like we see here on the table, in about the 1740s through the 1770s. And um, the taste for this style came from a taste for the Rococo, which was a style from, that came from France that was popular at this time, that was an aesthetic that was all about, you know, more is more. It was very natural. There were lots of curving lines. There was lots of, um, you know, things on top of others, lots of layering. And so the idea of, the, of lots of, 
of colorful ribbon sort of spin, like spinning around inside of your goblet stem really follows that style. Um, so that's why they were so popular at the time. Yeah. This, this technique, too, Zinfirico, is something that I learned from Italian glassmakers, uh, people like Lino Tagliapietra. He's just really, really good at it. Uh, and when, he, when he's twisting the cane, it looks like fluid. It's, it's amazing. And I'll try and emulate that a little bit as I make it. Um, and another person is uh, Livio Serena. And actually, uh, I assisted him out at the Pilchuck Glass School. And uh, he told our class, he mentioned that his family went back many, many generations of glassmakers, many years. As a matter of fact, his family held the patent to Zemfirico, so the twisted cane in the 17th century when this was being influencing, or when it was influencing uh -huh. uh, English glass as well. So, Very cool. Which is kind of interesting to learn yeah. that from that lineage. And, and Definitely. What a fun honor. Yeah, so um, Brad, could you pull up the first slide that I put together? Yeah, so I put this together just let's, to show you an example of flash. some of the really great 18th century uh, uh, color twist stem goblets that we have in our collection. And you can see they're made with, you know, lots of beautiful colors. You have white and yellow and blue and red. You know, they were really into anything, you know, more is more again. Um, and another really interesting thing that you might notice when you look at these lovely twisting colors is that they look kind of like ribbons. And we think that maybe the popularity of of this style maybe went hand in hand with another thing that was very popular at the time, which was a fashion accessory, which were ribbons. Ribbons were a very big, were very trendy with women at the time who were following Rococo fashions coming from France. And, um, you know, women would wear ribbons, you know, tied yep. in bows at the end of their sleeves. They would wear them at, the, at, at the, the hems of their skirts. Sometimes they would be sort of in rows on the stomacher, the sort of the front panel of their dresses, or, you know, around their necks and their hair. It was a very popular fashion accessory, and it was also very inexpensive. You know, instead of buying a new dress, buying a new pair of shoes, buying a new hat, you could change out your ribbons. And of course, in the Rococo style, you could just add on more and more decorative element to, to uh, jazz up the things that you already had. Uh, Brad, could you go to the second slide, please? So uh, we ha I wanted to show you an image of a painting that we borrowed for the In Sparkling Company exhibition. It comes to us from the Yale Center of British Art in New Haven, Connecticut. And it is a painting of Mary Little. Um, it was painted by the famed uh, British portraitist Thomas Gainsborough in 1765. And on this painting, we can see that she has a beautiful pink ribbon that has uh, sort of some black lace tacked on top that's wavy and really beautiful, and it's tied in a bow on the back of her neck, and she has a ribbon in her hair as well. And, uh, you know, ribbons were such a big, were very popular at the time also because um, the textile market in England was really booming at the time. It was just like the rest of the economy. And uh, Mary is the perfect example of that growing economy and the wealth that was being made at the time. So Mary's father and also her husband built their wealth in the textile industry. They traded in textiles, they imported and exported, um, and they built a massive, uh, massive wealth at the time. And you can see that in what Mary's wearing. She's wearing some of the beautiful textiles and ribbons and laces that her father and husband would have traded in. So naturally, she's wearing them. Um, and, you know, they built such wealth that, you know, they were the kind of people that would have owned some of these fantastic, luxurious, beautiful uh, glass objects that we have displayed in the exhibition. She would have been sort of in the top 5% of the wealth class in England, and that's who would have owned the objects that we have on display. And so that's kind of the, the big, great circle from from uh, glass, t from color twist stems to ribbons to our friend Mary Little, um, all the way back to our glass again. And Jeff, I'm really excited to see what you make. It's really fun to see rainbows added in. Yeah, so, um, so I'm at a point now, I just, I just rolled up uh, some white canes on this clear core, and I'm gonna work on the core of this cane. So I'll do a filigrana part 
and then I'll do a, a little vein that is a ribbon of rainbow colors and that'll be attached to this. I'll break it down so I have enough to make a couple pulls, but I'm just gonna do one here tonight. We're gonna, gonna do a little bit of a cooking show style. Uh, I have some parts in the, the garage that we can use for a stem so we can start working even before the cane is cooled down because that's gonna take several minutes. I wanna make it thicker uh, so that we can make nice substantial stems with it. Now if I was gonna make a vessel out of this, I would make it much thinner uh, and then I would fuse them together and roll them up on a blowpipe and form a bubble out of it so it'd have the pattern in the vessel. But since we're gonna make stems out of these, I'm gonna leave them thicker. And since things are gonna get a little trickier for me, I'm gonna hand the mic over to Tom Ryder and he's gonna help out with the narration. All right, so we've got a really nice roll up that we did there. We rolled up um, some fairly, sh some short canes, not the biggest pieces of cane. We rolled them off of a grooved pastorelli so that they had some spacing in between. So as we can kind of look over Jeff's shoulder here, we can see some really nice white lines and little spaces of clear. We wanted to roll these up off of that grooved pastorelli and we can kind of choose the spacing. I know that Jeff has experimented with all different types of spacing on this particular piece. And uh, it's going to be really interesting. I, uh, before the show, I was kind of chatting with Jeff about how to make this cane. If you're familiar with Jeff Mack and his work. He's made all kinds of beautiful goblets. I mean, there's kind of, in this range of work and making these beautiful goblets, it's, it's really amazing to see Jeff put these pieces together. Now this, this cane on the inside, this Xanthirico cane combined with this rainbow on the inside, it's, it's quite the fancy cane here. I mean, there is a, going to be a lot going on um, one thing that I was curious about is, is Jeff going to twist this cane before he adds the rainbow to it? And now we're watching him as he twists it a little bit further. This is definitely quite twisted before we add the rainbow to this piece. Ah, I see what's going Let's on. Let's put We've it in the garage. Several. Pony. Yeah. This. Uh, yes. Yeah. On a pony. So this one uh, roll up that we did, looks like it. we have enough material to make two different cane poles out of this. So we'll take one half of it and put it away in our garage. Now, these larger pieces of glass we can set into our garage kiln. It's, on the, it's in the far corner of our stage over here. Um, that'll kind of babysit that little piece of glass. We never want to let it just cool off too quickly. It'll crack and break. So we'll set this into a 1,000 degree kiln. The glass sitting at 1,000 degrees is totally solid, totally solid and stable, so it won't change shape. Not much will happen to it. But we'll take half of this and put it away. So Chris will bring over a uh, pretty heavy punty there. So that'll be nicely attached. You might even call that a, a post that that will end up sitting on. But Jeff will keep half of that color pattern and Chris takes the other half and we'll put that piece away. Now, these, the, the Zanfirico cane and the rainbow, they're, we are going to have this interior twist. It's like a double helix on a double helix. There's a lot going on in this particular cane. Um, it's one thing that a lot of us like to experiment with here at the museum is all these different beautiful cane patterns. And most of us will typically look to Jeff for a little bit of advice on how to do them. So we have this kind of double spiral situation going on. I'm trying to figure out how to exactly explain it. But we'll have this spiraling white, a, a spiral of white canes with a spiral of rainbow canes around them. I guess that's the best. A spiral spiraling around a spiral. So it'll be a, a complicated little piece of glass. Now when we pull and twist this cane across the amphitheater, we'll get, oh, I don't know, I think we'll get at least 12 feet of cane here. And each goblet needs three or four inches of cane. So we only need a little, little tiny piece of it. 
uh, it's not it, it's not always that we get uh, we could use a hundred percent of that piece of cane, but in this 12 foot long cane pole here, we'll get hopefully 20, 30 different goblets out of it if we wanted to. These beautiful goblets will be available for sale, actually. They'll come up in the glass market. You can check them out on uh, the Corning Museum of Glass's website. But we'll have some of these beautiful goblets up for sale. It's a fun new thing that we're doing here at the museum. You can watch us make these beautiful pieces of glass and then take it home with you. So it's kind of a cool new thing that we're doing just this summer so far. And uh, we're excited to have these pieces available to the general public. So we set our spiral of white canes into that garage. These guys are chatting back and forth, trying to figure out the next couple steps in the process. And we have this beautiful rainbow of cane that will be part of the spiral on top of a spiral of cane here. So most of the time when we have to, when we're going to heat up these canes, we need to preheat them. So we set them inside of the, the garage kiln and then turn the garage on. It takes maybe an hour or so to get nice and hot. But once the canes are at 1,000 degrees, it's totally safe to take them out of the 1,000 degree environment and bring them over to the 2,000 degree environment. If we took one of these canes at room temperature and threw it into a 2,000 degree kiln, it would most likely crack and break. It would be a little bit like taking an ice cube and throwing it into a hot cup of coffee. It would snap and pop and break, and we'd end up not having anything that would be really usable for us in this situation. So Chris had the rainbow of canes preheated inside of the garage. He's taken them out of the garage into the reheating furnace. And we can see on the screens now that Jeff is preparing kind of a, a T-shaped post, a T-shape. Now we can see up on the screens, Chris has those rainbow, the rainbow of canes. Oh, great shot there. We're zooming right in. Now those canes are warm. They're pretty hot right now. You know, maybe 12, 1300 degrees or something like that. And they're starting to stick and fuse together. Now, throughout this whole process, while we're making this beautiful rainbow, uh, it's, the colors will look really different. Uh, we've gotten a few good zoomed in shots as we're making this, but for the people here in the amphitheater, um, the red color tends to look really dark and brown. The orange color kind of looks red. The yellow color kind of looks orange. So they kind of look a little bit off and wrong. As glassmakers, we have to just trust that when these colors come back to their original form, when they cool down to room temperature, we can see those true colors. So while we're working, oftentimes these colors look very, very different. They don't look right. <clears throat> so they'll come back to room temperature and we'll see those true colors. We can see them uh, here on the table in the amphitheater. We have this really beautiful, vibrant, bright rainbow of color. <clears throat> All right, so Chris has those fused together. You see him there pushing and pinching them together, squishing those glass colors together a little bit. We are working with a rainbow of color here, so some of those colors, we would refer to them as stiff colors. Some of those colors we would refer to as soft colors. So the actually the red, orange, and yellow that I mentioned, those are usually a little stiffer. The blue, green, indigo, and violet in this case will end up being quite a bit softer colors. They'll absorb that heat a lot faster. The stiff colors kind of stay firm. They don't really melt as easily as those softer, darker colors. So it's definitely been kind of interesting practicing making a rainbow out of glass. The different glass colors react to the heat very differently. And take a look closely now. Jeff will pick up the rainbow of canes on the end of that T-shaped post. 
uses a pair of tweezers and presses that on. And we get this really beautiful little rainbow on the end of a solid steel rod. All right, so I'm, I'm most interested in how Jeff is going to kind of combine the two elements into this one piece of cane. We'll have that beautiful spiral of white glass color, this really nice rainbow that'll spiral through it all. Looks like it's a little, little long, a little too tall. So it cuts through that glass. And we get that to be the right size. So these thin rods of colorized glass um, need to be encased in clear glass. Uh, we have this thin rainbow and it would kind of just all kind of melt together. It wouldn't, wouldn't exactly work unless we completely encase it in some clear glass. So this is going to be a, a big drip of hot glass right now. So watch closely. Chris will bring this hot, fresh gather of clear glass. Jeff drips that over the top of both sides of the rainbow of cane. We are live streaming this demonstration out onto the internet here, so we get a lot of glass makers that watch these demos. Sometimes glass blowers will put a big blob of glass on one side of those canes and then another big blob of glass on the other side. Uh, Jeff likes to take that large amount of glass and drip it over the top. Um, most of us would do that very unevenly. It wouldn't work so nice and smooth, but Jeff's been doing this for a very long time and he'll make a lot of these processes look very, very easy, dripping that large amount of clear glass and he ends up with like this perfect encasement of this rainbow of glass color. He makes it look very smooth, very easy, but uh, nice, nice additive bit of glass there encasing that rainbow. Yeah, okay, so we, roll, we picked up those pieces of cane. Now those little rods of cane are round. They're like, little, like a little pencil or something like that. So when we roll up these canes, we have two little pieces of steel to make sure that those round canes don't roll off of the plate. We call it a ferretti, ferretti. Um, and it's a little piece of steel that we paint some ceramic kiln wash on. That's like a, um, it's essentially like a, ver it's like a very watered down porcelain, like a watered down slip or clay that you paint onto the steel so that the canes don't stick to the steel. Hot glass sticks to anything else that's hot, but this whole plate and the steel, everything's hot, so it would actually melt and stick to the plate, stick to the ferretti, but we cover the whole thing in a kiln wash. Um, so like a, a very watered down ceramic material and we end up being able to have, being able to heat up the glass on that ceramic plate and not have it stick. So the little Ferretti make it so that those uh, canes don't roll off the end of, of that plate. All right, we're getting into some really interesting detail here. So. Take a look, it looks like Jeff tried to pick up that white spiral and totally missed. So normally we would pick up that, that solid piece of glass directly on the center of the end of that steel rod. In this case, he's picked it up totally off center. Um, this is going to set us up to make the spiral around the spiral, um, so setting that white spiral off center and then we'll s somehow, I'm not really sure how, he's going to put this rainbow of cane right next to the white spiral. Yeah, should be pretty interesting. Someone was wondering if you could encase each cane before adding them together to make the rainbow. Sure, sure. Okay, so somebody online, we got a question from online, somebody was wondering if we could encase each cane before uh, 
putting them all together to make the rainbow. Yes, we absolutely could. Now, anytime you encase those little colored rods of glass, you'll end up with a layer of clear. So in this case, we want that rainbow, all of those colors, to essentially be touching each other, like a real rainbow. If we wanted to, we could encase each one, but you'd have a space of clear in between each color. So when you fuse those rods all together, you'd end up with a little space of clear between each color. So in, it, it would just be kind of a, an aesthetic choice, and I think Jeff likes to have that rainbow all nice and together. Look at this. For all of our glass makers out there that are watching this demo, this is quite the setup for a piece of cane. So we have the off-center white spiral. We have the off-center rainbow. And now we can st start to envision how this will end up pulling and stretching and being a rainbow spiraling around the white spiral. <laughs> it's, it's cool. It's going to be really cool. It's hard to talk about. There's, a lot, there's, there's so much going on here. There's so much going on here. But we're all excited to see it come about. Sure, sure. So that we're, Jeff was just mentioning, this is definitely the hardest part, making this, this beautiful spiraling piece of cane. When you look at these goblets, you'll look at them and you'll say, wow, that's such an interesting little bit of cane in there. It's really nice. Um, and then once you see it being made, you get this whole new appreciation for exactly how this really intricate little stem is made. So it's a really special feature on this type of a goblet. All right, so, <clears throat> oh boy. Oh, he's coming over here. <laughs> <laughs> Brad's having to do some handy camera work up there as Jeff <laughs> runs from one side of the stage to the other. He's trying to get the rainbow kind of flattened out. He's using the edge of our large marvering table here. So <laughs> rotate, trying to get the right corner to kind of press these two bits of glass together. You know, it's really important that they nicely seal together and become fairly smooth. If there's like a big groove where these two bits of glass connect, and then we collect more material over top of it, we're going to trap a big air bubble in the glass. So we're trying to make sure that everything's nice and smooth. So Jeff was just trying to use the corner of the table to kind of compress things together. Um, that's one really important thing in making these these cane stem goblets. Um, not having a big bubble that would end up stretching and being, it, it would definitely be a visible part of the design. So we're kind of smoothing things out before we encase the entire piece in clear glass. So I believe we're about to see some type of plunge type of a gather. So if you've taken a gather out of a furnace before, you'll notice here Jeff goes very vertical. See how straight up his hands are? Going straight down into the glass first. His hands are up into where the heat is coming out of the furnace. He goes very vertical, straight down into the glass, and he ends up completely encasing the rainbow and the white spiral. So that ver very vertical gather, plunging that pipe into the glass kind of directly from above is a technique to, again, not trap air bubbles in this pattern. So even if there was a little bit of a groove or an indentation in between those two uh, patterns, you can kind of eliminate collecting a bubble in the middle of the two patterns by going sh kind of straight up and down like that and pushing that glass in. Any air would push back towards the pipe and we're not encasing a big bubble in the glass. So another 
thing that takes lots and lots of practice here, that's for sure. So now we can start to make things pretty round. Start rolling the glass back and forth on our marvering table. We've got this great big beautiful marver here in the amphitheater. When we got this huge marver, somebody told me that it weighed a thousand pounds. So we have a thousand pound steel table. And now there's no bubbles. <laughs> so Jeff just mentioned no bubbles in the piece there. What's it called? Yeah. <laughs> Really? It's a technical term. All right. Technical term for not encasing a bubble in the glass like that. When you do that vertical gather, technical term is burping. I didn't know that. <laughs> so I guess you get the bubble to come back towards you. Interesting. You learn new things every day. <laughs> I should know, yeah. <laughs> All right. Jeff, do we gather over this again? No. Okay, this is it. Okay, we want, so we could potentially collect another layer of clear glass over top of this and then pull and twist it, but we're not doing that this time. He wants that rainbow of color to be out close to the edge of this cane pattern. So uh, we're not going to really encase it with too much glass. We want a larger proportion of color within this piece. So uh, this will be enough for this cane pull. We have two cane ladders set out on the floor here in the amphitheater. So I, I don't think it'll be a, a super long cane pull. We want nice dense saturation in the color for the rainbow of this piece. We want to really be able to see that rainbow. It is possible to pull and stretch that color a little bit too far and have it kind of fade away. So in this case, we'll keep that color really nice and dense. We won't stretch it too far, but we're just looking for this beautiful spiraling rainbow. So Jeff will set up his cane pull. A lot of glass makers out there, there's lots of different techniques for pulling cane and organizing this cane, how to have the heat. The main objective is to have the heat really nice and even. We want everything really nice and hot so that this glass will pull and stretch and elongate nice and even across the front of our stage here. So these guys will be doing one cane pull here, and they'll be twisting and twisting and twisting as they pull and stretch this glass. So they'll be pulling and stretching and twisting at the same time. Sometimes you have to, if, you're, if you make a lot of cane pieces, you do a lot of these twisted canes, and you start to feel the fatigue of turning and turning and turning. They only need, they only need to do one. So they'll be quite all right. There's all these cool new ways of pulling and twisting cane using a drill. You can attach the glass to a drill and pull the trigger on the drill and it'll do all the twisting and turning for you. But we'll do this one by hand. Might end up using the drill attachment uh, if you had to do lots of these. You never know, this could end up being one of our most popular products here at the museum, and we could end up uh, making lots and lots of these. This is already a beautiful setup for this cane. Jeff said the core is a little cold. He's, you know, when you're pulling and twisting these canes, things need to be really just right. So we want to make sure that the core is nice and even in temperature with the exterior surface. We want that heat to really be sunken into the core of that cane. So in this case, 
Jeff will take a heat, roll it back and forth on the table. Take a heat, roll it back and forth on the table. This thousand pound piece of steel absorbs a lot of the heat out of the glass. So it absorbs the heat on the surface of the piece while letting that heat sink into the colder core. Want to make sure everything's nice and even before we get this really complicated cane pull here. Question. <laughs> Long enough metal straw. I bet you could. All right. The question was, could you, could you use a long enough metal straw to put a bubble into a gather, into a gather? One long enough that you wouldn't burn your face by being so close to the larger piece of glass. Uh, I bet you could. Um, there's actually several techniques where we would intentionally put a bubble into a piece of glass. And you don't necessarily need, even really need a straw. You can take a large gather of glass, like what Jeff has right now, and just poke a big indentation into the surface of the glass. And then you could poke a bunch of big indentations into the surface of a piece and let it cool down. You let it all cool down. And you head back into the furnace, and you collect another layer of clear glass over the top of all of those indentations. Anywhere that there's an indentation in the in the surface of the glass will trap a large air bubble. Now, if you wanted those bubbles to be really big, you could use like a straw. You wouldn't necessarily need to blow into that bubble of glass or anything like that. If you had a larger diameter straw and you s s press that into the surface of the glass, you could definitely trap a larger air bubble. All right, so Chris has what we call a post. Jeff has the cane pole. Chris's post is just a little bit of glass on the end of a three quarters, three quarter of an inch diameter solid steel rod. He's got a little disc on there and he's let it freeze. The post that Chris has is probably only, oh, I don't know, 1100 degrees. It's solid glass. Jeff will bring over the larger cane pole. I think this is the moment where he brings over that cane pull and we'll start to pull and twist. This is one of my favorite parts here. Take a look as Jeff brings over this cane pull to Chris and we get that initial twist, that first twist. I always think that's one of the most beautiful moments in glass where we start to see the rainbow twist around the white spiral. Look at that. Now we're using gravity to our advantage. Chris's hand is all the way up in the air for a moment, letting that glass drip off towards Jeff. Jeff has much more of the material. So Jeff is in control here of how far. Chris probably won't move his feet. Jeff will move his feet across the amphitheater as we stretch and pull and twist. This is where your forearms start to feel the burn. But we're pulling and twisting, so Chris goes a little bit more vertical again, letting that material drip down towards Jeff. Chris has stopped twisting. The end, you can see the orangey glow on Jeff's end and less of a glow on Chris's end. The glass looks clear, it's colder and solid, so it doesn't make sense for Chris to twist anymore. Jeff has the heat, Jeff has more material, so he'll be the one pulling and twisting towards the end of the process here as we pull that material all the way across our studio. We get a good, we, we've got a good maybe 12 feet or so of some really, really fancy cane. If you're here in the amphitheater, you get to really witness something very, very special. We could see that glow in the glass, the orange of the, the, the rainbow is much more orange, much, much more of a bold, pattern there. Jeff calls for a flip. They kind of flip the whole thing. And here at the end, they start to pull a little harder and they start to get some tension. Creating a little bit of tension will make it so that this, this cane stays relatively straight. So we want it to be really nice and straight across. I'll give these guys a, a pair of tweezers. Let me break that material free. All right.
So, a very successful cane pole. Let's give these guys a round of applause. <laughs> Jeff Mack and Chris Rochelle on a beautiful cane pole. Now this, the cane is a, a long cylinder. If you're familiar with glass making, for the most part, most of these pieces of glass would be annealed. They would be slowly cooled down overnight. The slow cooling process alleviates any stress or strain left in the glass. When we pull a cane like this, we just let it sit here. That cylinder is a very stable shape. The glass, as it cools, it shrinks. And if it shrinks unevenly, that can cause stress and the glass can, can crack. But sitting out here, this very stable shape, nice and consistent all the way through, it'll just sit there and be, be just fine. It'll cool down to room temperature without cracking and breaking. Now, every little section of this piece of cane will get reheated. We'll chop it into little sections and it'll end up being uh, lots of nice stems for beautiful goblets. Um, so every little section of this piece of cane will be used again. And once we have the finished product, once we have the goblet, we will then let it very slowly cool down. So right now, this would be considered unannealed glass, um, which could potentially crack and break, but that, that shape keeps it nice and stable, and it'll, be, it'll probably be just fine sitting out here. Now, you might have noticed we have these things that look like ladders. We call them cane ladders. If you did set this hot piece of cane on the concrete floor, the concrete floor would probably cool the glass a little too quickly and it would crack and break. So setting it on, on the wood, the wood does not absorb nearly as much heat out of the glass as the concrete or a steel or aluminum floor or something would. So we set it onto the wood and it'll be just fine. And now we'll get into making parts and components for a beautiful goblet. Someone is wondering, so if you would take this cane and cut it up into slices, is that how you would make marini? If we were to take this cane and cut it up into very small slices, is that how we would make marini? And you could, this cane is really complicated. There's a lot of, there's a lot going on. And if you did slice it like that, um, into small sections and lay them all out together. You could roll them up on the surface of a bubble or a collar, and you would get a really interesting color pattern out of it. So you could technically consider that a marini. It would have a little section of the rainbow, and it would have, you know, maybe 10 little white kind of spiraling spots. Um, so this is kind of a process for making marini. It's just that if you were really making marini, you might kind of plan it a little bit differently. You might plan it so that it looked better as a cross section. You might layer those rainbow colors a little bit differently so they would end up making a little smoother pattern. So I, I would say you could use this. It would, I think it would make a pretty interesting pattern. But if you were really kind of planning it, this, this cane looks better from the side, is what I would say. Um, so if this was going to be a marini, I think it would look good, not great. I think you could probably plan it a little bit better to make it into a nice marini. All right, we are blowing glass now, so technically, we didn't really blow any glass or inflate any glass just yet. But now, Jeff is blowing and inflating a nice bubble. So this will be uh, the cup top, I believe. It looks big enough to be the cup top. I don't think it's going to be the, a little foot. So it looks to me like this will be kind of our larger example here on the table. It's kind of like a, I would say it's, maybe in between like a uh, wine glass. It could be used as like a water cup, a water glass, if you were. Definitely a wine glass. It's definitely a wine glass. <laughs> I guess you could drink water out of a wine glass if you wanted to. <laughs> but we've got the one, well, there's, several, there's always lots of different shapes and things that we can make for 
the cup top of a goblet like this. So let's see. So what we're doing here is a little bit like uh, like a cooking show, kind of. So earlier, we pulled some of this cane to make our example pieces. We chop these into little sections. There's a couple different ways of, of chopping the glass into sections like this. So Chris has the stem that was some of the previously pulled cane. We'll add that onto the bottom of our wine glass just by heating both, both ends of the piece there, end of that piece of cane, the bottom of the wine glass, nice and hot, and they'll weld together. So we're building this goblet in several parts. This piece will have three nice parts, the cup, the stem, and the foot. So Jeff will build up a little bit of heat on that stem and nicely adjust the stem itself. Might be a little tall. We could remove a little bit of extra material. And we'll go ahead and adjust that stem, make sure it's running nice and on center before we begin the process for the blown foot. So it looks like this <clears throat> goblet. What's that? Oh, it's a solid foot. English style solid foot. Perfect for our new exhibit in Sparkling Company. If you haven't seen it, you've got to get here to the museum. These exhibits are usually on display for just about a year, maybe a little less than a year. I think this one will come down in January. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe in January. So the museum here has several rotating exhibition spaces, and we put on all these beautiful special shows. Oftentimes, when you go to a museum, you're seeing a very small percentage of that museum's actual collection. So our way of showing the pieces that are in the collection that are not currently on display is using several of these rotating exhibition spaces. Uh, in Sparkling Company is in our kind of main rotating exhibition space. That's our big show for this year. So we will do an English style solid foot. This should happen pretty quickly. Take a close look here as Jeff will add on a large hot bit of glass onto the end of that little cane. So we've got a lot of material on the end of the cane, but look at this. This is a footing tool. It's two pieces of wood and a hinge. He'll open that hinge and close those two boards on that bit of hot glass, turning really nice and fast, and he ends up with a beautiful flat round disc. A very difficult tool to use. It's a simple tool. I mean, it's just two pieces of wood and a little hinge, but that is a really difficult tool to use. And again, Jeff makes it look really nice and easy. Getting everything just right. Now the soda lime glass that we're working with here today, we can't let it get too cold too quickly. So we'll build up a little bit of heat on that cup with the torch. So much of glass blowing is managing the temperatures in the glass. So making sure that the cup top itself doesn't get too cold, leaving the foot out of that torch flame, letting the, the foot solidify and stabilize a little bit. And we're ready for the punty process. Chris springs over a small punty here. A little bit of glass on the end will act as a glue. This will stick and fuse into the center of the bottom of the piece. Jeff chills that initial constriction line in a sharp tap to the pipe. And that glass will break free really nicely. So we have a nice and successful transfer, flipping that piece around. We've exposed the small opening on the very top portion of the piece. 
And all we really need to do is pull open that very front edge of the piece. We'll end up with this really beautiful goblet. Now the lip of the piece is broken glass, so it's probably sharp and has some imperfections. We'll get it really nice and hot, and that'll melt everything nice and smooth on the front edge of the piece. So this is a bit of a longer heat to get that glass from about 1,000 degrees where it was solid and brittle enough to crack and break. Uh, Getting that back up to about 17 or 1800 degrees. Where we can melt that front edge of the piece nice and smooth. Oftentimes, there's a little extra thick glass around the very front edge of our piece. So Jeff will trim away that extra thickness. This will have a very nice and elegant and thin lip on the piece now. I don't really want that to be too heavy on that front end of the piece. So you'll see him periodically put the whole piece inside the furnace, making sure that the stem and the foot don't get too cold. And then backing out of the furnace, focusing the heat just on that very front edge of the piece. Jeff has an interesting angle, holding the pipe up in the air, letting gravity, see that angle that he's holding the piece on? Letting that lip of the piece kind of fall away from himself and almost fall open. So a small amount of pressure on the inside of the lip of the piece is all it should take to pull open that very front edge. And we make a nice open drinking glass. So, I mean, this piece, the piece itself, doesn't take much time. It's the cane, that special cane. We can see some beautiful examples of this process in our new exhibit in Sparkling Company. All right, the final step for a piece like this is the slow cooling process. Chris has a fork. So hold on to this piece. We'll put this piece inside of our 910 degree kiln. It'll slowly cool down overnight. A little water and a light tap is all it takes. This is usually a little sharp spot. We'll smooth out that little sharp spot with a torch. We'll set this piece inside the kiln. Some of the other pieces that we've made so far today. We'll get a closer look at that one at room temperature again tomorrow. A beautiful piece by Jeff Mack, Chris Rochelle. A big special thanks to Linnea Seidling as well. All right. Oh, cool. He wants to do one more stem. Let's keep it rolling, folks. Let's make another beautiful piece of glass here. Excellent. So we'll make one more stem. We could thank Linnea anyway, though. <laughs> yeah, I'll give Linnea a nice thank you. All right, folks, as you can see, we've got several examples of different shaped uh, drinking vessels that we'll have here. And I think we'll make probably, a, I would think, a different shape, right? We'll make a different shape. Boy, it's got a good amount of glass now. So it could be a, oh, he might cut some off. I was thinking maybe you're going for like the bit, like one of those huge red wine glasses. Oh. A coupe, the champagne style coupe. So I think that's the kind of the lower bowl. All right, folks. So we get to kind of catch our breath a little bit here as Jeff puts together another one of these really beautiful goblets. They are done in parts and pieces.
All right, so take a look here as Jeff starts to inflate the cup section of this piece. We are using the auto inflator system here. So you can see Jeff has a hose attached to the back end of the blowpipe. There's a foot pedal on the floor. And every time he taps on the foot pedal, it releases a little bit of compressed air through our compressed air system into the hose, into the pipe, and out into the hot glass. This is our new way of doing things. This is our new way of blowing glass and, and keeping our masks on here at the museum and staying nice and safe. This new compressed air system is actually, a lot of us are growing to really like it. It's something that we're going to keep around even if we don't need to wear the masks. So it depends on the piece, actually. Me, personally, I think it's actually pretty difficult to make a nice wine glass with this compressed air system. So Jeff is uh, showing us how it's done with this compressed air system. It's pretty difficult to use for smaller, more delicate items like this. Most of us are starting to like it for medium size pieces, even some larger size pieces it ends up being really nice. For our medium sized pieces, we're able to make them a whole lot faster. So whenever we can be a little bit more efficient in the glass blowing studio, we end up really enjoying that. Being able to use that compressed air system for production glass items. A lot of our local glass makers are making things like glass pumpkins right now. Sometimes. Uh, Sometimes people think we would make a glass pumpkin in the fall or a Christmas ornament uh, in December, but usually the glass artists need to be a season or two ahead of time so we can get them, photo get the pieces photographed and delivered to the glass market here at the Corning Museum of Glass. So that's where most of our local glass artists are selling their work, right here at the Corning Museum of Glass. These beautiful goblets will end up going up for sale. So all of them will be available. <clears throat> Looks like Chris has the stem for our next goblet. You see he's using a torch. He's, that torch is burning natural gas and oxygen and heating that one end, just liquefying the one end of the piece so that'll stick together with the bottom of the cup. This is the moment where we put it all together. We like to really hit the dead center. That's probably one of the harder parts of this process. As Jeff guides that glass onto the center of the bottom of the bowl. You see that beautiful spiraling pattern? We end up with a really nice stem on the bottom of the bowl. All right, so we've got a question from online. What's another way of making a foot on the bottom of a piece like this? You know, for the most part, when we're blowing glass and, and doing our glass blowing demonstrations, we'll stick with a couple different types of feet. We can add a solid bit of glass onto the bottom of the piece. Um, typically, we refer to these, these footing tools that we have as a Swedish style foot. Um, we could use another blown bubble of glass to make a foot. It's essentially like making a little plate, a little flat round disc out of a round bubble of glass. Now a foot on the bottom of a piece could be anything. If you think of it creatively, it could be a bunch of leaves. It could be all kinds of really interesting little spirals and things as long as it holds the piece up off of the surface of a table. So, I mean, a foot could be really anything. Um, Chris is uh, assisting this demonstration, but I've seen Chris make a beautiful foot that's like three leaves uh, on the bottom of like a tropical looking goblet. So plenty of things could end up being a foot, but you could do all kinds of different sculptural elements that would be the bottom of a foot, uh, the bottom of a piece for a foot. So this piece, we typically refer to this as a Swedish style foot, the, that wooden tool to squish and squeeze the glass like that. 
I believe was developed in some of the bigger Swedish glass houses, but obviously some English glass was made with these nice solid style feet. All right, Jeff gives Chris the okay. Jeff's left hand is turning the pipe, his right hand is controlling the tools, and he doesn't have any other hands for bringing over additive bits of glass like this. So Chris will jump in and bring over another bit of glass. We'll add this on in the coil on style. So we'll touch it down onto the bottom of the piece, draw it around itself, coiling that material around on itself. And here comes one of our Swedish footing tools. It's actually a different Swedish footing tool than the one he used before. And you can squish and squeeze that into a round disc. Now, if you're here in the amphitheater, you can see, maybe on the screens there, you can see as well. Jeff did not like that foot. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and remove it. It's hot glass. We can cut through it when it's that hot. Just cut it right off. Um, that footing tool that Jeff just used is the one that we normally use for making a big vase or a big bowl. Yeah, that footing tool makes a big foot. And uh, he said he's got a really small footing tool or a really big footing tool, and he wants something in, in the middle here. So he's back to the smaller footing tool. And we'll squish and squeeze that glass in between the smaller footing tool. And we'll see if he likes this one. It's looking pretty good so far to me. No. Again, we'll cut this one off. Nope. That's quite all right. Now you see him using the torch, making sure that the rest of the body of the piece is staying nice and warm. So as long as the piece stays above, oh, let's say about 1,000 degrees. I mean, really, the critical temperature would be around 900 degrees. But as long as the glass stays nice and warm, you can kind of reheat it all day if we wanted to. I don't think, we'll, I don't think it'll take all day to get a nice foot here. Maybe a couple more. We'll have to bear with them for at least one more. I think he'll get it on this one. We've got a couple practice runs. And then we'll go ahead and add our third foot to this one. I think it'll go, I think I, I've got faith in this one. Coiling that material on, that liquid hot glass. While that's still nice and hot, we take that those wet wooden boards. Those boards need to be wet when you're sculpting and shaping the glass when it's that hot. The water turns into steam. The glass rides along on a thin barrier of steam. So far, he's not cutting that foot off. I think we got it. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right. So we got a nice base for the piece there. And we're ready for the punty process. So Chris will bring over our small small punty. We have different size uh, punty rods and blow pipes depending on how much weight they're going to need to hold. If you're going to make a great big vase or a big bowl or sculpture or something like that, we would not use any of these rods that we're working on right now. These are very small and lightweight and can support only a small amount of weight. So these are best for these smaller, more intricate, delicate pieces like this. Travel things back and forth together, making sure everything's just right, and we'll break the piece off of the blowpipe, chilling that constriction line with a cold tool and a sharp tap to the pipe, and the glass breaks free very, very nicely. 
So we've successfully flipped this piece around. We'll start to work on the top. All right. So again, this will be one of the longest heats in the process. We're getting that really beautiful view into the back end of our reheating furnace. There's a camera. It's not in the furnace, it's behind the furnace. It's looking through a very special piece of glass called fused silica. The fused silica was developed here in Corning in the 1930s and originally didn't really have much use until NASA came along and started using it as their space shuttle windows. So the, the glass protecting our camera can withstand the heat of a space shuttle re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. Perhaps even more importantly now, that fused silica is the core glass to fiber optic cable for high-speed internet. So an ultra-pure fused silica used for that fiber optic cable that we all love for our high-speed internet. If you're watching us online, there's probably some, some fiber optic cable developed right here in Corning delivering that delivering this particular live stream right to your home. So we did the trimming process, removing that very front edge of the piece. We can trim the glass to just make the whole piece shorter. In this case, I think it's mostly to remove some extra thick glass. So that'll end up being a little thinner. All the different wine glasses that you see nowadays are, um, they're so thin, the glass is like paper thin. So glass makers try to kind of mimic that as well. It's very thin wine glasses on top. When the glass is that thin, it's actually kind of flexible. We can make these pieces so thin that you can squish and flex the glass in your hand. I don't think this one would be that thin, considering we would be shipping it somewhere or something like that if it does get purchased. I want it to be a little bit durable as well. So Jeff is pulling open the front edge of this piece using the metal blades of the jacks. He does have another tool called parchofies up on the workbench. He has graphite parchofies that he has preheated. They also look like they've been waxed a little bit. So a graphite, a hot graphite parchofi Looks like a little bit of wax on them as well. Has this round end to the blade. Look closely here as he pushes down into the corner. See those larger blades? This will set us up nicely to have this kind of rounded lower corner of the cup. Very, very nice. So whenever we're blowing or inflating the glass, we never really want to blow very hard. Whenever we're pulling open the front edge of a piece like this, we never want to push very hard on the surface of the glass. Glass blowing is something of finesse. If you are blowing hard or if you are pushing too hard, it just means that that glass is not hot enough. So get the piece a little bit hotter. We can flare open the front edge of the piece the way that we need to. Chris runs a wood paddle on the very lip of the piece to make sure it's staying nice and flat and level with the foot. We'll give the foot a little bit of heat, let the cup itself cool down and solidify, warm the foot back up. We're just kind of balancing the temperatures, evening out the temperatures in this piece. So Jeff gives you a nice look at that beautiful goblet. And again, this will go into the annealing oven It'll slowly cool down overnight, alleviating any stress or strain left in the molecular structure of the glass. The amount of time it takes a piece to cool down is driven by the thickness of the piece, not the overall size. 
this piece will be fine with about a, maybe a 12 hour cooling cycle. Mostly be thinking about the stem of the goblet in the annealing cycle here and the connections, I guess. But that piece will head into the kiln with all the other pieces. We'll let that slowly cool down overnight. And there you have it. Another beautiful piece by Jeff Mack, ladies and gentlemen. Another nice thank you to Linnea Seidling as well. Chris Rochelle on the assist. Thanks, Jeff. Excellent job. All right, folks, that'll conclude our live stream demonstration. Thank you so much for being with us here in the amphitheater. Thanks so much for watching online. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.